All right, so um, anyways, we got a special guest here today, Amal Sarwat. And uh, he has a uh, tremendous background in cybersecurity, uh, particularly with, um, let's see, I believe you work for Fidelis and Cloud Passage Worldwide Threat and Security Research Labs. Uh, responsible for network endpoints and clouds. Uh, he's devoted his career um, to protecting and securing, educating the community from threats. Um, got a lot of background in vulnerability research, malware, um, IoT, SCADA security, and uh, been in this for two decades now, right? Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is threat hunting using MITRE attack against Carbonac malware, very nasty malware out there. So please, uh, give a warm welcome to our speaker here, Amal. Thank you. What now? Good? Thank you. Thank you. How about now? Good? Okay. No? I'll, I'll just speak up a little bit. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. I am actually super excited to to come here for a face-to-face -face conference after about like two years. I think uh, should, could, could be the same with uh, some of you or most of you. So really nice to be here, especially at B-Sites where uh, always the focus is on, uh, on community and collaboration. So let's get started. Uh, as as uh, it was uh, introduced, this session is about threat hunting using MITRE attack uh, framework and against Carbonac malware. So the rating for this session, like how you have movie ratings, PG-13, R, is intermediate or actually beginner to intermediate. So do not expect to, for, for me to you know, open up IDA Pro, open up a binary and show you and things, things like that. So this is, uh, this is not, not that type of a session. So what we are going to do, well, oh, actually, before that, my, uh, 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 you already know my name is Amol. I work for Fidelis. And on a day-to-day -day basis, I work with a really great team of uh, security engineers, reverse engineering people, um, um, malware researchers, and things like that, and get to learn something new every, almost every day. So it, this, is, this has been a great learning experience uh, working with these folks. So, that's, that's about me. So uh, again, coming back to this session, uh, as I mentioned, uh, what we'll look at is we'll look at uh, threat hunting, what is threat hunting, and how um, possibly this session can help you a little bit do uh, more threat hunting. It's about using the MITRE attack framework, and that's the reason I chose the Carbonac malware because it's so well known, it's so, it, ha it has been sort of researched and studied by a lot of people. So it's a lot, lot easier to uh, understand and go over it. By the way, how many of you have heard about Carbonac? A lot of you, good, good, that's good. So I think that's, uh, the, that, that will be good for our session. So let's, uh, let's get started. Mm, threat hunting, um, I mean, why do we still do threat hunting? There are so many automated tools, so many uh, ML AI based uh, systems that uh, I think you, you might have deployed in your organizations to, to catch malicious behavior. So why do we still do threat hunting? And the reason being that uh, in addition to automated uh, cybersecurity, automated cybersecurity is essential. But in addition to that, some of the sophisticated threats can sometimes get past automated detections. So a lot of the automated detections, I mean, you know, a lot of these automated detections, they used to work based on IOCs, based on like, uh, you must be hearing this on a daily basis on your job, on 
with uh, file hashes, uh, IP addresses, URLs, blah, 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 uh, which, as you know, can be tricked very easily. Some of the systems are based on behaviors, which is a little bit better. And now we have a lot of systems uh, based on AI, ML type of things. But still, uh, some of the advanced threats uh, require a threat hunter to go there and look at uh, look at uh, the system and detections uh, and sort of try to find out something which these which the automated systems cannot now again i'm not <laughs> no by no means i'm saying automated systems are bad these are very very essentials but uh, they, they they can be a good tool for in uh, threat hunting uh, also because a lot of the threat attacks can be low and slow and we'll see what that means as we go forward so uh, that's 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 the reason we we do need uh, threat hunting. So let's let's give a formal definition. So this is like sort of my definition. So threat hunting is an iterative search. So I think there are like two really key phrases here. So one is iterative. So it never sort of finishes in one go, in half a day, in one day. It's it's, it's an iterative search, going through a lots of data, your network data, endpoint data, cloud data, container data, what, what, whatever resources or whatever data that you have, and trying to detect malicious or suspicious or risky activities that evade, now this is the second key phrase, is that evade uh, detections using existing tools. So it's iterative and trying to find out something that evades uh, existing uh, tool sets and existing detections. So that is something sort of I made up by combining two or three <laughs> other different definitions. So there are, uh, generally when people talk about threat uh, hunting, there are three different models that people talk about. So this is the most, uh, uh, the model that has been used for a long time, which is intelligence-based threat hunting. And what that pertains is that, uh, let's say you are in a SOC, you are a threat hunter, uh, generally, uh, organizations get a lot of open source or closed source uh, feeds that they buy on intelligence. So what that is, is a feed of uh, bad file hashes, files that are bad, so you can see if your network, your emails, your whatnot have those files. Bad IP addresses for where malware uh, does a command and control or communicate with. Bad domains, URLs, uh, bad HTTP requests and whatnot. So this has, I mean, this was like sort of like the first uh, go-to uh, model for threat hunting where you get these uh, IOCs uh, in your intelligence feeds and then a threat hunter, once an alert is triggered, once uh, your system, I mean, you have to use some sort of an automated system to trigger you to let you know that, hey, I got an alert based on this file hash or on this email or whatnot. Then what the threat hunter does is, uh, based on these IOCs, it, he or she can investigate what happened before and what happened after uh, that alert. So what happened like maybe five minutes, 10 minutes before that alert, or maybe even more, like a larger time frame on that particular box, and what happened afterwards. So that, this is uh, essentially your uh, go-to intelligence-based threat hunting. The second model is a situational model where a lot of people begin with. And uh, what happens here is in the situational model, there is a hypothesis. So uh, let's say you your organization is a healthcare organization. And uh, your uh, security team or people who you collaborate with or whom you report to, they tell you that, hey, there is a malware going on which is targeting healthcare organizations. and it. Um, can you can you try to hunt for it and see if it exists in our networks, in our uh, cloud, or in, in our containers, whatever sort of infrastructure, in our emails, whatever you are trying to threat hunt with. And uh, you, so you get a trigger like that, and then you essentially uh, research that malware, look at um, possibly the Intel IOCs for it, look at the behavior for it, and try to find that behavior in your uh, again, in your logs, in your networks, in your emails, whatnot, what, uh, whatever access uh, you have and whatever domain of threat hunting you are working with. So that's the situational uh, model. And then there is a third one, which is a hypothesis-based model. Uh, in this, what usually happens is uh, 
A Threat Hunter uses indicator of attacks or IOAs and TTPs, which are tactics, uh, techniques, and procedures, and use some sort of a framework like the MITRE attack framework uh, for, for for threat hunting. I think most of you must have, I mean, uh, how many of you have heard of the MITRE attack framework? I think all of you, yeah, great. That's perfect. So, uh, so this is the, like the third model, but again, there is no real uh, saying that you use only one of them, you can use all of them, you can interchange them, you can do whatever, because the attackers out there, they do not stick to a certain set of rules, and there are no rules for them. So, I mean, there is no reason why uh, you or any threat hunter has to stick to one or the other. You can sort of interchange and exchange them. So that's a little bit on, on some of the threat hunt, hunting models. Let's, uh, let's take a quick look at MITRE, uh, MITRE attacks and their TTPs. So uh, I think these uh, few definitions would be enough for this presentation. So a tactic, that's the first T in the TTPs. A tactic is, represents why. Like why is an attacker trying to do that? So the attacker's um, tactical objective could be persistence. They want to remain on that box even if you know that particular uh, machine is rebooted or whatnot, or they want to move laterally, or they want to execute some files. That could be their tactical objective. So a tactic represents why an attacker is doing that, and a technique represents how the attacker does that. So. Uh, a tactical objective could be persistence, to remain on that box, uh, unnoticed, so maybe being unnoticed is one uh, tactical objective, and persistence is another, and how they do that is uh, the technique, which is, well, if you are using Windows, you go to this registry key, you add yourself there, and even if the machine is restarted or whatnot, your malware would start again. So that's uh, sort of like the tactic and the technique. And the procedure is essentially, there are a, lot, a list of procedures that uh, MITRE has documented that uh, various different thread groups have used uh, to combine tactics and techniques. And we'll, we'll look at uh, some of the procedures as, as we go through. So these are really the only three things uh, that, that really we need for this presentation. Let's look at uh, some of the tactics. Now this is a pretty busy slide. Uh, MITRE updates their framework periodically. We are currently on the 11.0 framework, uh, the MITRE attack framework, and this is how it looks like. Uh, oh, oh, good, I think it's, it's readable. So I think the first two things uh, were added recently. They were part of the MITRE pre-attack uh, framework. So pre-attack was essentially the homework that an attacker um, does or you know, the before carrying out an attack. So that consists of reconnaissance and resource development. And now they are, from version 11, they are in the MITRE attack framework. So reconnaissance is reconnaissance, and essentially if you are targeting, let's say, a healthcare organization, an attacker before attacking would uh, try to find out uh, what type of healthcare you provide? Where are you located? What type of uh, uh, what type of systems do you work with? What types of uh, patients uh, you have, and things like that. So he or she can uh, think of how to infiltrate it, what systems to expect, what uh, social engineering things to do to uh, get into the organization. Uh, resource development is uh, once once uh, he or she has that information, once the attacker has that information, they would try to develop a resource, uh, try to maybe create a web page, an email, an invoice, or something like that, which closely resembles to what uh, your uh, organization's employees are used to seeing, so that when they see that, they would think that, oh yeah, this is something I, it's for me, I belong to. So that's uh, reconnaissance and resource development. Initial access is initial access, how the attacker gets or um, gets foothold into your organization. Could be social engineering, could be <laughs> just leaving USB drives in, in the parking lot. And MITRE has really uh, done a really great job in, uh, in classifying further uh, what these uh, tactics and techniques are. Uh, the next one is execution that, uh, that details how the 
malware would execute, uh, what would it be like PowerShell, would it be this, that, then and we'll look at get into the details uh, after this. Uh, persistence, we talked about persistence already, how uh, the malware would persist, uh, reboots, or even sometimes, uh, I mean, there used to be malware that could uh, even survive an OS reinstall, so firmware-based malware and things like that. And then privilege uh, elevation. So once uh, once you have some lower privileges, how do you find uh, accounts or, or how do you elevate your own privileges on that box? Uh, defense evasion, so that means uh, if there is an antivirus present on the system, how do you evade that if there is uh, some sort of a network uh, or endpoint uh, detection and response system? How do you evade that system? Um, and and the, the list is, uh, well, I think, but it's, it, it's good to go quickly through the list. Credentials, access, how to access credentials. Discovery is how to find uh, other targets that are of importance. Let's say you, as an attacker, are on one machine, but that machine is not of much importance to you, so how do you find other machines? And then how do you laterally move to those machines? Uh, collect data that you want to collect, and then uh, essentially uh, create a command and control um, channel to your mothership to where you are to infiltrate or exfiltrate uh, data that you want to exfiltrate. So these are the main uh, tactics in the MITRE 11.0 framework. Uh, go to, uh, please go to the open source framework, and there is excellent documentation and subcategorization of, of these. So this is one of the examples. The uh, tactic here is persistence, and this is uh, persistence had some categories, some subcategories, and the techniques are listed. Like how would you do persistence uh, if it is a Windows box, via this, via that? And then the procedures are how some of the malware, like uh, I think here you see APD, oh, this is better to read, APD28 or other uh, malwares, uh, other malware families or threat actors have used this um, uh, this particular tactic and this particular technique. So that's a little bit on uh, on uh, MITRE attack framework and on threat hunting. So let's uh, take an example to sort of really tie uh, this together. And as I mentioned, I took example of the Carbonac malware. Now, Carbonac uh, is a pretty well understood threat group. It's both. It's a threat group as well as it is uh, it is uh, it is the actual name of the, of the malware that people refer to. And it it was active uh, a few years ago. Um, it targeted uh, financial institutions. So, Carbonac essentially stole a billion dollars, and this is a uh, you know, pretty uh, large sum of money from more than 100 financial institutions in 30 countries. So you can see how, how devastating this was. Uh, from what I know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of people behind the Carbonac malware have been apprehended. Uh, and I think that's that, that's a good news. But when I look at these numbers, it's mind-boggling. I mean, uh, I mean, um, <laughs> a lot of you may have worked at startups or are you working in larger companies? Like, if your revenue is a billion dollars, imagine what is your valuation. I mean, uh, you generally get like some X valuation, and uh, if this was a company, just 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 it's just these numbers are just mind-boggling. So anyway, we are here to talk uh, about threat hunting and the technicalities of it. So let's go and let's see how the malware infiltrates a typical organization, how you can use a MITRE attack framework, and how as a threat hunter you can use a MITRE attack and some of these tactics and techniques to your advantage against uh, some of this malware. So this is uh, the brief attack working. Mm, I think let's let's start uh, with an overview. So from the top left, what you have is this attack was carried out by phishing. I mean, I know we are in 2022, but still phishing remains uh, mm, the number 
one cause of initial access or initial breach. So, in, I mean, phishing involves a lot of things. So it also could involve uh, uh, other social engineering aspects like uh, clicking on links, social media, blah, blah, blah. But again, we are, we are talking about Carbonac. So Carbonac used phishing. Sent a phishing email to a bank employee, uh, and we'll see all of this a little bit more into detail in subsequent slides. Send an email to a blank bank employee, mm, compromised that system, laterally moved to a lot of other systems trying to find the privileged account. So I think that is what uh, most of these threat actors do is try to find the privileged account because they are not interested in an account if, or, or, or a machine if you don't have any access. Uh, from there, what they did was they really uh, studied how, uh, by the means of screen recording and key loggers and whatnot, how many transfers are being done and uh, in, in that particular organization, and then carried out fraudulent transfers, uh, carried out uh, things like controlling a ADMs, where they had some mules, some people uh, go to certain ADMs at a certain uh, time, and they would dispense cash in that ATM, and they, these guys would just grab the cash and uh, take their cut and whatnot. So this is sort of like an overview of how things work. Let's. Uh, go into the details. One important thing to sort of keep on the back of our mind is that this did not happen overnight, even in the single organization. So I, I mentioned there were like hundreds of organizations that were targeted, but even in a single organization, this did not happen with a single click. This was like a low and slow attack. So basically the attacker was in the organization's uh, network for days, weeks, and months. So it's not like you download something, you click something, boom, uh, something happened. This is where the attacker was inside that organization for weeks at least. So uh, I think that sort of gives us a context of um, how, how the attack uh, works and uh, what, what, what really happened. So initial access, this is, uh, this is one of the first thing that uh, mm, comes to mind. And uh, again, I'm not going to read the things on the slide. But this sort of details uh, various tactics and techniques uh, uh, and sub-techniques of how an initial access can happen. So in case of Carbonac, uh, oh, I don't have my pointer thing. But uh, it was essentially phishing, uh, which is sort of somewhere in the middle there. And uh, this is an example of phishing email that was sent. So this is from the link below from our Justice Department, which did uh, a good file on Carbonac. It's based on the Carbonac files. And this, uh, an email, something similar to this, was uh, sent to bank, to one or many of the bank employees with a word attachment. So um, that's pr pretty clear here. So as you know, I mean, in these type of attacks, the employee opens the Word document and, uh, uh, oh, here, here I talk a little bit about mitigation. So OK, let's, let's talk about phishing mitigation. I mean, it is one of the social engineering types of attacks. So uh, the mitigation for this type of attack or initial access, uh, we are only talking about the initial access, not about the entire attack, would be user training, uh, uh, anti-malware, IDS, IPS type of scans, or email uh, security like DMARC and SPF. So you can read up on, you may already know about all these techniques, and they may have been already there in your organization. But uh, looks like, do I have the right presentation? OK. <laughs> uh, but from an um, attacker's uh, perspective, or from a threat uh, intel person's uh, perspective or from a uh, threat hunter's perspective what uh, you can uh, what you can uh, what, what what you can look at is how do I catch all these uh, different emails so this is uh, this is a graph created by uh, it's on github it's created by a center for threat I mean the link is right there on github and it shows uh, what are the different, uh, on the columns, what you have is are all the 
uh, tactics, all the mitre tactics, and it has highlighted what are all the tactics that Carbonac used. So this is again, this is, this is not created by me, the link is here. And what we are discussing right now is the first one, which is the initial access part of it. So um, this is a MITRE execution. So what happens when you get an email? You, you get an email. These are the various uh, techniques and uh, sub-techniques that MITRE has for execution for various different uh, operating systems. And in execution, what happens was a bank employee, he then opens a Word document. You got a Word document, you open it, it looks familiar. The Word document had an embedded OEL object, object linking and embedding. Uh, this is a very old technology. Um, back in the 90s when Windows was, uh, you know, when you had the DOS disk operating system, I don't know how many of you remember that, and you go to the command prop, you type, win and then windows start windows was not like a <laughs> operating system yet uh, this has exist uh, this oel has been there right from the birth of windows even before it was a uh, operating system but mm, anyway so a bank employee opens the word document there is a embedded oel object which has an encoded visual basic script now this visual basic script executes it runs and it establishes a RAT, a remote access trojan. Um, it establishes a connection from that particular machine of the victim which opened the email to the attacker's uh, server. So what, what can we do as threat hunters here? So one of the things that we can do is, well, we have a lot of tools at our disposal. So the example of the tool here that I've given is oledump.py, dash py. What it does, it, it uh, identifies, uh, if you give it a Word or an Excel or an Office find, file, it identifies macros in it. And that's an example there. Uh, at some places you would see there is a M written there. That means it has identified a macro inside there. Now, uh, this could be one of the things where you are browsing through or where you are threat hunting. You, are, you have a lot of files. You are looking at a lot of uh, email attachments that your organization gets. What you could do is you can sort of deploy some sort of an automation that extracts uh, the attachments and run this tool to find which which uh, which uh, at which attachments or files have macros. Now, just because a file has a macro doesn't mean it's malicious, but it at least gives you a good point to start with. What you can do after that is uh, deobfuscate the PowerShell or other code in that macro. And uh, if there are some TTPs there, some domains, some URLs, and try to identify them and uh, start your threat hunting that way. So those are some of the things that a threat hunter could automate, could, could, could do on this. So the Next, so what we saw was execution, initial access. The first arrow was getting a email, uh, phishing email. The second one was execution, execute the uh, macros in the Word document um, and execute the shell script from that. The third one, what the malware did was it did some discovery. And this, these are the techniques that MITRE has for discovery. And the one that uh, Carbonac used was trying to find the host name, trying to find the domain, trying to find as much information about the machine that they are on. Now, from an attacker's point of view, they are sort of blind. They know their code has executed on some machine. They don't know whose machine is it, what credentials do they have, where are they? So they are in this uh, discovery phase, and that's what MITRE uh, categorizes as discovery, where they try to discover who they are or where they are and uh, things like that. So in case of Carbonac, and the, the T letters in the parentheses are the MITRE uh, techniques and sub-techniques. So every technique, sub, uh, technique and sub-technique has a unique ID. So those are the unique IDs for uh, the MITRE unique IDs. So uh, I think once you have the presentation, you can possibly click on it or just Google on it and get more information. So what the attacker does is, okay, there is an email. 
it executed they are on some machine they have a cnc but they don't really know what that machine does where they are in the network hierarchy they just know that they are somewhere and again keep in mind this is a slow and low attack that means it's not it, it happened over the course of weeks with a lot of times real attackers real people not like completely automated sitting on the other side so uh, and and what the uh, first rat does is it executes a wmi script to get all this information so wmi everyone knows the wmi right that's the windows management interface Another thing that you can look as a threat hunter is try to find which machines are uh, doing WMI queries. I mean, again, just because some machine is doing WMI queries doesn't mean that it is compromised. But most probably in a financial institution, your normal uh, banker or a clerk or HR would not really do WMI queries. So that is something if you have an endpoint system is as a threat hunter you can immediately look at is, okay, this sounds suspicious. Why would anyone do WMI queries in my organization? Uh, but this is what uh, Carbonac did. Mm, using WMI queries tried to find all this uh, information in the discovery part. Then came uh, command and control, execution and exfiltration. So in command and control, the attacker uploads uh, some power uh, shell scripts uh, and starts taking screenshots of the user's desktop. And it's all an attempt to find out where they are, who, whose machine they are on, and what they are doing. And uh, uploads all these uh, screenshots to the attacker's uh, CNC uh, server. Now this most probably would be automated. There will be no one sitting on the other end. but the malware essentially just takes screenshots and uploads them, uploads them. And someone there in the attacker's, uh, I would like to call data center, uh, later uh, looks at these screenshots and see if there is something of uh, interest. So um, those are the techniques that are, that are pointed by the arrows. So one other, another interesting thing in this chart is although um, I mean, instinctively, we go from left to right. We like to say that, okay, there was initial access, then execution, then this and that. that. But, I mean, it's not necessary, and most of the time, it's not like attackers are there to follow MITRE's guidance. They don't, I mean, you know, they don't have to, and they don't do in, uh, in, in sequence. A lot of times, you would see that they would go from one place to another, come back again, and, and, and these uh, things would really jump in these charts from here to there. So although we like to, th I mean, instinctively, we would like to think that an attack always happens from left to right. Uh, I mean, uh, as you can see, the attacker would jump back and forth uh, between these uh, techniques and tactics. So okay, what happens after that? The attacker, so there was an email, execution email, uh, screenshots trying to find out who they are. Then they deploy a second stage RAT, uh, Remote Access Trojan. What it does is it uh, writes some uh, code into the Windows registry, obfuscate that so that most uh, scanners or AVs won't sort of try to, would not f find it as uh, suspicious, and uh, then run that, uh, run that uh, shell code. And after execution, they essentially receive a callback, and this is where uh, they receive a callback as in, uh, this is where an attacker, like a real attacker, a physical person, if he is interested in that machine, would do more things on that machine. So they do this callback on a certain TCP port, and this falls again into execution and command and control. So now the attacker has complete command and control access uh, to that particular box. And again, it falls in these categories. The reason I always go to this chart and these categories is because these are the MITRE categories. Uh, they are highlighted with the Carbonac. And uh, uh, I think as a threat hunter, you can really look at them into detail. And I think it will really help you in, in your effort. So OK, what happens then? The attacker is on the box. He, has he or she has executed command and control. They can look at you know, screen captures and things like that. So then they try to uh, dump uh, credentials. So there have been some uh, UAC bypass vulnerabilities, and that is what the attackers use to dump the current user's uh, credentials. 
So there is a tool called as open source tool called as Mimikatz. I think how many of you have heard of Mimikatz? Okay, good. So Mimikatz was, as as you know, was written by a developer to to show Microsoft um, the vulnerabilities in their uh, authentication and credential system. And pass the ha pass the hash was the the first uh, most famous Mimikatz function has been downloaded and used by a lot of researchers and things like that. Unfortunately, some of these tools or many of these tools have are also used by attackers for their advantage. So uh, Carbonac uses a modified version of uh, Mimikatz to uh, dump credentials. Uh, Mimikatz, again, has an, now evolved. It has a lot. So what my Microsoft did was because of the pass the hash, they, they moved to tokens, then Mimikatz upgraded itself to pass the token, and then, I mean, if you, I, I would really recommend you to look at the different features of Mimikatz, what it does, and how it has responded to, uh, to different uh, security mechanisms that are introduced in the OS. Um, I really think open source tools really help in increasing the security overall of the uh, ecosystem, but again, it's a very different talk if you want to debate on, on that. So anyway, so it uses Mimikatz to dump plain text credentials of the current user because they have screenshots, but they need credentials. So that is uh, here in, uh, in, in the MITRE framework. After that, the machine may be of interest. The machine, the, the current machine that they are on may not be of interest. So they, the attacker tries to do a lateral movement to different uh, machines and try to find machines that are really interesting for him or her. So uh, Carbonac used uh, several tools uh, for lateral movement. Uh, several second phase uh, rats. So the first uh, remote access tool is really they want to be hidden, not noticed. And now they are like sort of upping up their game and to taking a little bit more risk because the more tools they try, they, they download, they send, there is more chance of your behavior-based systems catching them. But I mean, they have to do this. So. Uh, they try to do these various techniques, and I'm not going to read everything on the screen, but they try to do these various techniques to move uh, laterally and to gain a shell on the domain controller. So they try to find where is the domain controller for that particular Windows network, and then they try to find uh, you know, where is that particular domain controller, try to get uh, using SMB on that domain controller. So Carbonac has used uh, PSExec, uh, is known to use TinyMet, uh, has downloaded and utilized PSCAP. These are all different open source uh, or different various utilities that it uses um, to um, get access. Um, and it has performed the pass the hash function. So that's where your lateral movement is. So discovery of privileged users. So now uh, they are trying to find where is your, where is the privileged user. So they use, uh, they, they, they try to uh, find these privileged users from the domain controller by running get ad computer, get net user, power view, and various uh, techniques that are, uh, again, documented and you can sort of Google on them and try to find out how, what, what those different techniques uh, do. So trying to find a privileged user. And let me just scroll through this. Once they find the privileged account uh, from the domain controller, they try to persist on that privileged account. And now what is this privileged account exactly? So this privileged account, what they are trying to find is an account of someone who does the transaction, who opens up the uh, financial, who opens up their browser or some other software and does financial transactions, um, uh, transfers money to other vendors, transfers uh, payment to other vendors. So that is essentially what they are after. And again, I have 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll breeze through this. Uh, and, uh, basically try to uh, create a covert access and profile the profile the victim 
uh, again create a reverse uh, shell with that privileged user's account. Uh, so now after setting up persistence, um, what, um, mm, what, what they do is they install, now, now they know that, okay, now I'm on the machine uh, of a privileged user that is doing these transactions, that is doing these financial transactions or that has some remote access to these ATMs and whatnot. And again, I think we have all this in mind. This didn't happen in one day. This happened where the attacker was in the network looking at screenshots every day in their data center, whatever was being uploaded. So um, this is so. Once the attacker knows that he or she is on the privileged machine, and this is the machine they want, they really learn how transactions are done in that organization. The attacker may have knowledge of generally how financial transactions are done, but how is it done in your organization? Uh, what software do you go to? Where do you click? How do you do that? So they really learn uh, what's happening uh, for that privileged user who does these financial transactions in, in, in this uh, phase. They install key loggers to uh, get your credentials or sometimes get credentials from your browser memory cache and uh, again use a reverse shell to, um, to, to obtain all this uh, information. So at this point the attacker uh, or Carbonac has enough information to and again look up all these T uh, numbers uh, to get, get more information on each of it. So at this point, the attacker has enough information uh, from the initial email to coming to being executed on a machine, finding a privileged user, uh, and finding how the privileged user behaves. They have enough information to now carry out an attack. This was just, uh, uh, all of this was still just trying to find information, staying low, and uh, trying to learn things in, in the victim's uh, network. Now with all this information, what they do is they essentially impersonate victim. Now it's really easy after this. Uh, things still now were difficult. Now it's, uh, they, they could install uh, some remote uh, control program like uh, VNC and uh, essentially use the credentials that they have obtained uh, to control the um, victim's machine. They already are on the domain controller, and I think uh, in one of these T rules, they have mentioned that they do see on their domain control machine if a user is logged in or not on that machine. When the user is not logged in, that is when they execute this, uh, they take control of that machine, and um, essentially from what they have learned so far, um, just impersonate the machine, do the same thing, do the same uh, banking transactions uh, for their benefit in their accounts. Um, so that is, uh, yeah, that is pretty much, uh, essentially this is when the attack is complete, the banking transactions are done, and the, the Carbonac has the money from that particular financial institution. Now it almost sounds like a movie, isn't it? Like, I mean, uh, Mission Impossible or whatever movies where an attacker is moving. But this is, as, as, as I said, that's the reason I chose Carbonac, which is a very well uh, known third group, very well re known researched malware. And whatever I've presented here is, I mean, you know, sort of common information now of how Carbonac worked and managed to get a billion dollars from more than 100 financial institutions in 30 different countries. So just, just a lot of uh, mind-boggling numbers. So, uh, so this was, was our original attack, uh, which started from a phishing email to a bank employee to find, to moving laterally, finding a privileged account, uh, using screen recording to uh, really learn how money transfers are done and then carry out uh, these uh, transactions. So if you augment it, if you add the MITRE sort of uh, framework on top of it, and the guys here have really done, the GitHub link is already in the first slide of creating this chart, then you can literally see how they jump from one phase to another of the MITRE techniques and uh, 
carry out the attack. So I think we have, that's all I have for today. We have five minutes. Uh, thank you so much, and I'll, I'll open it up for questions at this time. Um, uh, questions here. This is a great talk. Anyone? Okay, well, I have one. Um, so, there we go. <laughs> okay. Use uh, some uh, browser related, as in stealing your credentials from the browser's memory. Uh, so, when the operator or the privileged user log, uh, went to their browser and logged into those uh, systems, uh, I mean, your, I mean, whenever you enter anything in your browser, it is in the browser's memories. And if uh, if you have higher credentials access on that machine that particular process can just read the entire memory and plug it out of memory. I mean, that's how, um, on, 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 I mean, we're talking about Windows here. I mean, that's how most debuggers work, right? Like, if you write a program and if you're trying to debug it, a debugger requires um, higher privilege access, but then can attach to other processes and show you memory and things like that of other processes. So that's what uh, they do is they, once they get uh, once they are on the box, they try to get those higher privileges on the box so that they can act as a debugger attached to any process and get a dump, a dump memory and things like that. So the man in the middle for the browser, I don't think, uh, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't think most probably uh, was used in Carbonax case, but I think they definitely used uh, the credential stealing from the browser. Okay, good. Um, other people got questions? Oh, great. Man. Okay. Anybody, anybody catch them in the act um, while, this, while one of their attacks was taking place, or was this all subsequent, like, they found that the money was gone. Research uh, or looked into how they were caught um, or if they were caught in the act, they were, um, like, all the Interpol and all the threat, um, all, all the sort of cops from all the countries were looking for it. They were found in I think Eastern Europe somewhere, um, and I don't know the details on how they were caught. Um, so yeah, sorry, sorry, I don't know how they were caught. So there, there is, I think, one one more question. But I mean, if 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 say that they infiltrated 100 organizations, they were definitely not caught in the first 100. Maybe it's the 101 where, is where they were caught. Uh, like you are, uh, in this case, you are a financial institution. You know that there is this financial malware going on. I think what the, the trigger that you have is, uh, as a threat hunter, you would immediately start to uh, research on uh, what does the malware do, do, how does it behave, try to communicate with a lot of uh, organizations or um, even connect with authorities to see if you can get a malware sample or if uh, try to find any and every information about that attack or malware and then uh, if you get some IOCs then yeah try to see if those particular IOCs are in your logs in your network uh, in your emails uh, 
uh, it really depends on your investigation and how much information is available. You can also look for behavior. So if there are no IOCs available, if there is not much concrete information available, there is no malware samples. Yeah, but if you even know the behavior or the common behaviors you have seen in the past, like we saw, like there are some uh, WMI queries being run or PowerShell being run or uh, sys internal tools being downloaded, then you can also look for those type of things because uh, malware writers use a lot of uh, uh, reuse of code. And, you know, No one is going to write all these tools from scratch. So they use all these existing tools. So I think one of the best things which could be done is to see uh, if these tools are running in on your uh, in your organization and does uh, that particular person really need this tool so if it's a banking organization as i said do you know do, does the person really need uh, powershell or wmi queries to do his or her banking transactions so yeah that's that's what i can suggest